go ahead. So this okay. is the uh, today's June 27, 2020, and uh, Shabbat. It is. Um, so I will just don't mind me in the mic. Um, okay, so we were talking. This uh, Leanne is going to go over the trichotomous nature of man. For you to know where to go, you need to know where you came from and where you are now. So we've gone through this. A lot of this comes from Watchman Nee, uh, scriptures, most of the scriptures. But um, Leanne's going to be teaching this. We're going to be recording this. So um, thank you guys for joining us. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for open hearts. Thank you for um, hungry hearts. Jesus, thank you that you are the one who shows us our need so that you show us how you are the only one that can fill it. Holy Spirit, Without you, we can see nothing, do nothing, receive nothing. Oh Lord, don't, don't allow any enemy to snatch away any word that would be implanted in our hearts. Lord, may our hearts be fertile ground to receive um, what you share. Anoint uh, my precious wife, Jesus, you have given, to her, given her to me as a blessing. Thank you that you have used her to preach the gospel through teaching as a teacher, as an anointed teacher. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Fill her mouth with your praises as she may declare forth your praise. Amen. Amen. Jesus said before he left the earth, he said uh, in Matthew 28, All authority of the universe has been given to me. Now wherever you go, make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them faithfully to follow all that I've commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Um, known as the Great Commission, to go out and make disciples uh, wherever it is that we're going. Um, unfortunately, it has been neglected in most congregations what discipleship is and how we're supposed to go about doing it. So this actually came out of a desire to um, do this part of the Great Commission, which is to make disciples. Mm -hmm. Discipleship is not just getting people saved. Discipleship is bringing them to a place of maturity, uh, and it assumes that you're sort of at a place of maturity, mm -hmm. and or at least on that pathway, somewhere ahead of the people who have no clue. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you bring them along and teach them what you've been taught. And as you continue to learn, they come along with you on the journey. And we're all on this journey in different places and spaces. Um, leading towards a knowledge of God. And John says very clearly at the end of his book, uh, the Gospel, that eternal life is defined as the knowledge of God and of his anointed one that he sent. That's eternal life. It's the knowing. And knowing in the Hebraic sense is to know by hand. It's to know experientially, and the ins and outs of life. And that's how discipleship has to be done, in the ins and outs of life. You can't do it through a textbook. You can't do it through a PowerPoint uh, slide presentation. Um, but that being said, it is good every once in a while to sort of step back and to look at um, the things that we are to know to share. And so that's, that's sort of where this came out of. Um, I have a few books that I will be referencing, um, perhaps a little bit here and there. This book, um, some of you guys have, The Way of Faith, which is a really great book by Jim Sire. He was a um, head of the YWAM group, Youth with Mission, down in Brazil. And um, I sent this in an email. Sorry if that broke. There's another one. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, I sent this in an email with all the is-bends in the, in the um, front cover. So if you feel inclined to pick it up, you'll have that information for you. So um, that's one book that's great. This is an easy read. 
Um, but I wouldn't suggest sitting it down and reading it in like one big thing. It's like worth taking your time through. Um, Spiritual Man's a little bit weightier. This is by Watchman and Me. It's actually three books in one. And um, this goes in depth into some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, Bondage Breaker and Victory Over Darkness. These are two books um, talking about um, living a life where you recognize Christ within you. It is the it is a sanctified life um, and breaking free of things that, uh, patterns of negative thinking, um, uh, strongholds that may be in your life that are keeping you from living a full life in, in Christ. So both of these are really good. Um, specifically, uh, Neil T. Anderson does a lot with, he's, in fact, he's the one who does the curriculum with discipleship um, and how to help people find freedom in Christ. So, that brings us to page one, which this is an overview of different types of counseling methods. I'm familiar with most of them. Um, the first one is really focused on salvation. That would be, examples, if you look down at the very bottom, um, would be like the Billy Graham group. Uh, those who are doing um, evangelism, that's really their focus is to just introduce people to the gospel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have a life and it stinks outside of God. Mm -hmm. God loves you and he wants you to be brought into right relationship with him. And, you know, this is where your apologist would come in and so on and explain um, who we are, different worldviews and so forth. Um, versus the Christian worldview and um, the goal of salvation. So then the next one, um, sanctification, they have sort of the main verse there is the Galatians 2.20. Um, our dear friends uh, from Chuck Solomon, Grace Fellowship International, um, he did a book called Handbook to Happiness. We'll be using some of the, um, some of the uh, handouts from his organization. Um, but it really shows how you have an exchanged life. It's not your life, it's Christ's life within you. And that is the power of our life. Um, so that's sanctification. Liberation is um, what Freedom in Christ Ministries, and they're the people who do the discipleship counseling with Neil T. Anderson, Bondage Breaker, and, and Victory Over Darkness. Um, they are looking at... Um, if you have a blockage in your life, some sort of an addiction, you've had trauma, you've had um, deep rejection, bitterness issues, you hear voices in your head, you've got, you know, um, you're constantly being condemned um, for everything that you do, even when you're trying to do right, and you can't seem to stop it. They deal with that aspect um, so that you can be free. That is uh, Freedom in Christ Ministries. They have a wonderful website um, that I believe is freedominchristministries.org or something. Um, and then... It shows you on the third column. Right, it's on the third the column. If you, I'm not familiar with, the, uh, yes, the with one, Deeper Walk Ministries, that, but if that's the Johnson third Marcus one down. Warner. And this is just, I mean, all of these ministries actually touch on every other ministry because you can't really parse them out. It's just their main thrust is that area. Um, and then the last one is application. So when you become a whole person and you are uh, you are able to walk in that maturity, it doesn't mean that you're, you're perfect. It just means that you have balance in your life and you are walking forward. Um, then you can begin to share this with other people um, and bring them along in a very um, overt way. I mean, we should always be sharing whatever we know. But you can come into a place of leadership to really bring people under your wing because you aren't spending so much effort just trying to get yourself in line. Uh, so now you can bring people in without it overtaxing you as an individual because you don't want to stunt your own growth in the Lord. So um, this is a, just sort of a helpful overview. All right. So the next page, I actually had Nathaniel write this one out for me. Um, I call this the trichotomy of trichotomies. Um, and I, I feel like this is um, not perfect, but it's a good representation of what we would have looked like if 
mankind had not fallen. Um, and we're going to take a look in Genesis to sort of um, flesh this out. So, starting in Genesis 1, um, and in verse 26. That's fine, I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to we have one. I have one here. Don't know that? Yeah, we yeah. have, we have yeah. plenty of Bibles. Oh, go grab two more, honey. I can't read. It's fine. One more. Okay. Time. okay. Yeah, we can work to. Yeah. Why don't you get Which one do you have? Uh, Fashion's translation doesn't have the Old Testament. Yet. Yeah. And they have Genesis, but it's not bound. I bought it, and I'm going to buy mine own. I bought it online, and it's so frustrating. In the okay, sure. electric, uh, electronic one. I don't like trying to look up the notes at the back end of a text file. Yeah. So okay, we're gonna look at Genesis one and um, verse twenty six. So we're right at the sixth day. God's made the animal. And he says the following. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Uh, they will rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And God also said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This food will be for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And he saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. And we're going to hop over to 2 and verse 4, which gives us a little bit deeper look into the creation of man. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation at the time that the Lord God made earth and heavens. No shrub of the field had yet been grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for Yahweh God had not made it rain on the land. And there was no man to work the ground, but water would come out of the ground and water the entire surface of the land. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and man became a living being. And we'll stop there. Okay, so there's a couple of things to pull out of here um, that... I have never heard it put that way before. Hmm. Okay. This is the Holman Christian yeah, it's standard. The HCSB. Yeah, we like that translation. I I've never heard it put that way before, and that that's amazing. Hmm. Well, praise God. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I will point out is in verse 26. It says that God says, and God there, the Hebrew behind it is Elohim. So uh, that implies a plurality of God, and He says. Let us, which emphasizes that plurality, since that is also plurality, let us make man in our image. So that leaves the question of who is us and our uh, for God. Well, we know from the very beginning of Genesis that the spirit hovered over the face of the earth. So there's a spirit that is there. There is God, Lord, Yahweh, uh, that is listed in here. So that's another name that is issued. And we know if you read the New Testament that Jesus says that everything was made by him and through him. So, um, you know, those are really the only three persons that we see. Um, and that would be your, your uh, trinity, if you will, um, or trichotomy of God. It's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And through them, all creation was made. It was a joint effort. It was communion. And that communion is out of that that they said, let us make man in our image and likeness. So there's two different things that they, they said they wanted as a goal to make mankind in, an image and a likeness. 
Well, one deals with the function or the form. Okay, so if God is three persons, then I would expect to see some sort of dupli you know duplication of that in mankind. And so that's what we have here in this picture is um, three different segments to us that mirror that that three different persons of God. Okay, it's the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's just, it's sort of that replication, that picture, and. Um, there is, uh, if you look in the, we have three different colors, but in the inner ring there would be the spirit realm, and then there is a soul, which is made up of the mind, will, and emotions, and then we have uh, the body, the external part of our body that we manifest on, on earth, you know, that's the part we can see and interact with. Uh, each of those three rings, if you will, are divided into further thirds. And which is why I call it a trichotomy of trichotomy. Um, and we'll take a look real quick at, at what those things are. But um, when he says he's going to make me or make man in his image, I think that implies the third, the three. And when you look at your person, we're one whole. You can't deal with us without dealing with all the parts. We're interconnected. You can't just slice out the body and only deal with the body because the soul interacts with the body and the spirit interacts with the body. Nor can you just pull out the soul and only deal with the soul because the soul affects the body. And anybody who knows that, you know, if you've ever had an anxiety attack, you know it affects your body. Yes. Okay? It, it, and it, it can depress you and, uh, and cause you to make all kinds of irrational decisions. So every type of thing that happens to us, every circumstance that happens to us, or perceived fear or whatever, it affects our whole body. So we have to look at our bodies as wholes and deal with them as wholes because that's how God created us. And if we try to parse it out, we will be um, ineffective. Um, the other thing is it's, it's the likeness too. Um, the likeness deals with, we, we take on the, literally the character of God. We were made to be children of God. So he made us in his his way that he is. He was creative, so therefore we have creative aspects. Mm -hmm. He loved, so we should love. I mean, that would be our natural bent if we hadn't fallen, would be to love. Mm -hmm. He he governed and had order and, and so forth in the earth. If you just look at the earth, you see that. Mm -hmm. We were meant to have the same thing. We're not supposed to have chaotic lives. We were intended to live in order and peace and love and with joy and unity, because he had perfect unity. So if we don't have those things, it's showing the malfunction of sin in our life. It's not because he didn't create us well. We were created good. Um, and so we, ha we also have the emotions that God had. Um, so, you know, God, God had definitely a mind. He thought of us. He prepared for us. He ordered and logically laid out for us this world. So there's a mental aspect there. He had a desire and a will. He desired to make man, and so do we. We have a will, just like he does. Uh, and he has emotions. He has a, a sense of this was good. This was this was like a satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, later on, we see love and joy and peace, and certainly patience and patience and patience with his people. <laughs> um, so he has these these things that we are supposed to have. Reflected in us, and you know, even anger. You know, God had a righteous anger uh, over what happened to His creation, um, and and we exhibit the same the same things. That's how we were created: was to reflect Him. And uh, and sometimes I think we forget that. Um, so He created man in His own image. He created him in the image of God. And I think it's really interesting here because man is correct. Uh, it is a singular word there. He created man, but then he created them in their image, but he created them male and female, and then he, um, and so on. So you either, uh, Moses or whoever wrote this section of scripture, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, doesn't understand how to use pronouns, or there is something that's being told to us here. And I think that the latter is the truth. Uh, you know, God created man, separated man into man and woman, and so now we have two parts, but they're one. And this, too, is a picture of God. 
It's this, this is all throughout the scripture. He puts the principle here, but it's all throughout the scripture that that separation and then bringing back together again. We're going to see it with the people of Israel. They're going to be separated uh, into Israel and Judah, but they'll be brought back together in one stick. We're going to see God the Father separated from the Son for a period of time, but then they'll reunite. You know, they were one, they got separated, now they're back to one. Um, you see the Jew and the Gentile, definitely at odds, but they're going to be brought into one nest, and that was prophesied in the prophets. So this idea of separating and bringing back to one is a very prevalent theme in the scripture. And it happens right here, to begin with, with male and female. Um, he gives them their marching orders, they're going to take dominion, they're going to multiply, and so forth. Um, and then we have, let's see here, did I miss anything that was important from that? I don't think so. Okay. So, um, I wanted to look at this, uh, this picture, the pre-fall man. There, the three aspects, the first one, and there is tons of verses, but this was like so last second, I didn't put them all in there, which is why I gave you the book, and then perhaps I will go back in and fill in all the verses that support this all over the place. Maybe if Eris comes back, he's much better at remembering all the, the verses. So if you can just like jot down any verses, references, because you remember the references way better than I do. I remember the actual text. For, for, for anything I say. Okay. <laughs> no it. You'd be like, oh yeah, that's Romans whatever. Oh yeah, that's, you know, just write it down. More. <laughs> <laughs> not to put you on the spot. No, no. You might need to. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so when we were created, we were created perfect, right? There was nothing, nothing amiss with us. Everything that God created was good. And he created us within, uh, to look like himself. God is primarily spirit, right? Yahweh is spirit. And um, Yeshua, when he was before coming down on earth, he was in, in the heavens with his father in the spirit realm, and he had no problem being there. Um, the spirit of God, obviously, is a spirit. So the, the part that was central is the spirit part, okay? Um, then there is the secondary part, and we'll call this soul, or sometimes it's called in the scriptures your heart, okay? Um, and this aspect of us is, uh, I'll, I'll come right back to this. This one, we'll talk about this one first. And then there's the body, and that's the part we see and touch and interact into the world with, because God didn't create us to live in the spirit realm in the sense of up in heaven with him. He would have made us angels or something. If you wanted that. He created man specifically to be on the earth, to govern the earth with his rules and his way, bring his kingdom here on earth. That was our goal. Yeah. So he made us fitted for the earth by giving us a material body to live in a material world. And that's necessary. It wasn't bad. It was good. And there wasn't anything decayed in that body. And there wasn't anything decayed on the earth to begin with. So um, all your, your senses all of your uh, physical workings of your body, the way that we perceive the world and bring that information in, is through the body. The interpretive part of the stimuli that we bring in is done here. Okay? Um, and then the spirit is the essential essence of us. Um, this got created, when God created us, it said that he scooped up the earth or he he formed us out of the dust of the earth. That's material, right? Mm -hmm. And then after he formed us, mm -hmm. what did he do? He breathed, breathed. He breathed. So he breathed out the breath of life, which is literally spirit mm -hmm. in the Hebrew, right? So he breathes that into us. It's his own spirit mm -hmm. that he breathes into us. Mm -hmm. And then a new thing is created, and that's this. The soul. The soul. Um, so the nefesh was what was created. This is why it gets sort of tricky sometimes to nail down the soul because it seems like it's part body, part something else that we can't touch. In fact, you know, psychologists, they sort of have struggled over the years trying to figure out, well, you know, where do you think? Where do you 
feel pain? Has pain really reside in your part of your body that got hurt? No, it's in your head. It's how you, you, you recognize the stimulus, but it's your head that interprets that stimulus. That's how you can have somebody who is in agonizing pain over a paper cut, and, and you know, like a child, and you have an adult who's had 90 million paper cuts and you don't even hardly notice it. You just move along. Yeah. And certain cultures will give birth to children and, and they, they never make a, a burble. I mean, they don't cry, scream, shout, nothing. It's just, you know, boop, baby comes and, and out they go and they're serving everybody. In that culture, you're not allowed to have all of the uh, hoopla about childbirth that we have here in the West. It's in their head. Really, pain is in your head. It's the same thing with emotional pain. Emotional pain that we feel is often related to how we interpret the circumstances. You can have somebody who goes through loss of house, loss of kids, loss of this, loss of that, and they say, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. And there's other people who go commit suicide. And, you know, you, how do people deal with, in, you know, the, the emotional pains of life? It's, it is a, a mind thing. And I don't mean that to diminish the mind. It's real pain. Mm. But it is, that's where it resides, in this weird spot in between body and spirit. Yeah. Okay? Um, this is also what makes us not animals. The fact that we... Um, have, I mean, animals do have a certain level of feeling, and, uh, you know, you can have certainly an animal that's sad when you disappear, or they lose their other animals that are around them and stuff like that, but uh, the will aspect is something that they don't share with us uh, quite as much or in the same way that we do, and they certainly don't have this spirit aspect. Uh, that is connected to God, because that's what the Spirit is meant for. The Spirit is the organ, if you will, like a heart or a lung. It is the organ with which we connect with God. Mm -hmm. God is Spirit. We are Spirit. Mm -hmm. And He made us in His likeness. Um, Watchman Nee goes through and describes the Spirit as having three parts to it. And he says that there is a part that is communion, a part that is intuition, and I don't know how it ended up on this thing, which way he puts it over here. All right. He put it in all different ways. I just sort of jotted it out. Conscience, intuition, and communion. And communion. So God initially created us to have communion with him. Now this is not a perfect diagram because it's static, it's like one shot. But this aspect of communion and will and breath, if we were to get to body, uh, is all able to expand or contract. And I'll explain that in a minute. But um, So this is not like your communion with God can grow. How deeply and how intimately you are related to God can grow or shrink, depending on your relationship with him. But he created us with the ability to have a relationship with him. This is all pre-fall, pre-cut off from God land. So this is the initial intention. Adam and Eve, when they grew, they were group, they were physically mature. They were mentally and emotionally mature. Adam didn't come out having to learn language. Mm -hmm. He could talk. Yeah. He could recognize his wife and had a concept of what a helpmate was. So he had a maturity about him. He could name the animals. He could name the animals. So he was not an imbecile. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was mature in many ways. But there was a lack. And we know that because Eve says is, is beguiled by the serpent, wanting wisdom of God. She knew that God had something more than she did. Mm. And she wanted that. Mm. And we could even say she had a pure heart in the sense of wanting to be like God. You know? But she didn't go about it God's way. This could grow, and I think it's always been a temptation for mankind to try to shortchange the process of growth. We want to get there faster. And, you know, that's where Eve was, is I want the wisdom now. Mm. And, um, and so that, that ended up being a, a pitfall for her. 
But we know that there was a sense of, I don't have it all yet. Mm -hmm. And so this, this area can increase in strength. Intuition is, you know, that ability to know the right thing to do without uh, any physical stimuli. This is an internal deep knowing. Mm -hmm. And um, if you ever just, you, you just know this is the thing I've got to do, and you can't explain it, and you try, it's usually something you don't want to do, um, and, but you know you got to do it, and if you try to put it off or ignore it, it just comes back like a nagging, yeah. you know, dripping faucet. Like you got to deal with it. Like yeah. a nagging mosquito. Right. So it may be something you're supposed to do or something you're not supposed to do, but you know it's there and you can't let go of it. This conscience is the thing that tells you, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really screwed that one up. It's not guilt, though. Yeah. And this can be confused with guilt. Mm. Um, this, you know that it's not guilt in that if you say, oh, sorry, Lord, I did this wrong, I shouldn't have done that, then there is forgiveness and peace. Mm -hmm. But if you say, oh, sorry, Lord, I did this wrong, and, and, you know, please forgive me, and you keep getting hampered, and it's still there in your ear, that's not, that's not conscience, that's guilt. Mm -hmm. Because God forgives. Yeah. He says, and he, he expects us to do the same thing, and he doesn't expect us to do that which he will not do himself. So if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. So if you <laughs> if you are getting nagged even after you confess, that's not conscience, that's guilt. Guilt is an evil creature. Mm -hmm. All right. The second ring, the soul or heart, uh, these are going to be similar. So I'm going to you know sort of keep my little division line. The conscience is going to sort of line up um, with the mind. It's um, where you process information, where you interpret the stimuli that you've taken in from the world outside of you, and where you think about things. This is what we are told to renew our mind mm -hmm. in Christ. This is something we could definitely control. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, there's a lot of questions in the psychological realm as to, do you think first, do you feel first? You know, uh, when we go through Neil T. Anderson, he tends to believe that um, what we think informs our emotions, um, and there's a lot of truth to that for a lot of people, but I think that also comes out of a generation that was taught in an educational system um, that mind was everything. Yeah. We thought about everything. That was a generation where everybody wanted to be an engineer. They wanted to be doctor, uh, lawyers. doctors, lawyers. It was very heavy on the Head. mental, intellectual understanding. Mm -hmm. um, recent apologetist uh, like Robbie Zacharias who just passed, um, he noted at the end of his life that it's very hard to do apologetics anymore. Because this generation is more motivated by their emotions, what they feel. And so they actually will just not even pay attention to the mind so much um, because it's all based off of what they feel seems like. or feels like it's right to them. And so you can't have a logical conversation with someone like that. It just isn't going to happen. Um, so, did it, you know... I, I think that the emotion sometimes informs our mind and what we think about that. If you've ever gone someplace and someone is there and you don't know them, but you just, you look at them and immediately have a feeling about them, and then you may back that up with uh, evidence that you're trying to find to support your position of what you feel yeah. about them. Um, you know, maybe an example of where the emotion is, is put primary. Certain people type. Are, tend to be more emotionally run. So these are not exact thirds. Mm -hmm. You know, some people tend to be very emotional in their makeup. Some people tend to be very intellectual. Just for sake of ease, I make them into thirds. Mm -hmm. um, and the last is will. Will is definitely something that you can grow in. That you can have a. You can have people who are naturally strong will, <laughs> but you can have you can have a growth in will. You know, there are people who are naturally not strong-willed, 
Yeah. And and they just oh, whatever, you know, they're sort of laissez faire about everything. And um, but they can learn to have and make decisions. There are people who have been so abused and so battered emotionally and mentally that they have very little on the will side mm. because they've learned any time they exercise will that they get smashed. And so they don't have this in a healthy relationship with the rest of of their soul. And we would say that, you know, someone who's basically balanced would have a, a, a balance here. You know, if you're only emotional with no intellect, you know, mind evaluation, then you would be out of balance or vice versa. All right, so body. Oh, you <laughs> Sorry, I'm feeling very teachery today. Um, you wear that well. Thank you. I, I love, this is actually my favorite thing. I was telling Eric, if I could do this it's all day long, every day, this is what I would do. Um, so I was just thinking about it. I was like, well, this is not, this is this is me thinking. So don't take this as gospel truth, okay? This is me thinking this afternoon because I was going, ah, try part here, try part here. I wonder if there's like three versions in the body. So as I was thinking about stuff that our body does, um, I just am throwing this. This is just for fun, okay? Um, we have electricity in our body. That's what we run off of. That's your, that's your nose. Or impulses, like electric impulses. I'm not talking about bad impulses. I'm just talking about, you know, electrical current. Think nerves. Everything runs off of your nerves in your body. And um, in a lot of ways, if, if you have a blockage in this, parts of your body just start working. You can't feel, you can't move correctly, uh, your organs will stop functioning depending on what nerve it is that's, that's uh, inflamed or hurting. Did you need some? Well, or if you have a small, small ones, if I see that, I used to have small ones. Um, so I was thinking, you know, electricity, that makes sense to me. Uh, also, that's how we um, think. Is, is through the electric, uh, the interpretation of electrical impulses. Um, emotions, I, I was thinking, you know, we got an awful lot of fluid in our life, blood, sweat, and tears. In fact, we talk about when we, um, if someone puts their whole heart into something, you know, or their effort into it, yeah, it's blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> it's fluid. That's the way we talk about stuff. I mean, I, I just, like I said, I was just having fun with this. Uh, and it, you know, fluid is, is sort of interesting because the properties of fluid is that there's boundaries mm -hmm. and it follows those boundaries. If there's no boundaries, you have a flood. flood. <laughs> <laughs> that can be destructive. Yep. You know, we want it to stay in the boundaries. And likewise, if you have an emotional person without boundaries, you could have a very chaotic experience with that person. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a good a good picture. Um, any type of fluid coming out of your body, body without boundaries. <laughs> explosive in a way you don't want to clean up. All right. Um, interestingly enough, those of you who know anything about death, you know that when death happens, what comes out? Fluid. Everything comes out. Everything comes out of every orifice that could possibly come out. <laughs> Great thought. Uh, will. <laughs> breath. This is. Breathe. Let's breathe. Sorry. Breath. Um, it is the only thing that you can increase. You cannot increase your fluid willfully. It would have to be disease or something that decreases or increases the amount of blood in your body. You can't just sit there and think, blood, more blood, I need more blood. No. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Breath you can train. People do it all the time. Swimmers yeah. do it. Yeah. Singers do it. Yeah. Anybody can expand their lung capacity mm -hmm. so that they can breathe more mm -hmm. or more efficiently. Mm -hmm. As you can exercise your will and you can also increase the level of communion with the Lord. So I thought it was a neat little parallel yeah. in our body um, that's there. So this is the way we were intended to live. Um, this is not how we ended up living. 15 minutes.
Should I keep going? Go. Or? Come on. Go, go. Okay. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. I'll give you... I'll be like... All right. Put a governor on. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we didn't stay here, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we didn't stay here. This was the place where we were supposed to be, walking and talking with God. We were supposed to be communing with him. What were we supposed to do? Working with him. The first picture we see is of Adam, and he is given, you know, the overall job of taking dominion of the earth and subduing it and being fruitful and multiplying. That's his, like, job identification, right? <laughs> but the first task he's given is, underneath that, is name the animals. And um, when that actually begins in uh, chapter 2, in verse uh, 19 it says, So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky, and he brought each to the man to see what he would call it. So he begins this uh, naming project. And um, I think the thing that's interesting is that it's God who brings the animals to him. Mm -hmm. And then Adam looks at them, observes them, and names them. And so it's, it, right from the very beginning, man was not meant to do work on his own. He was meant to do work with God, in communion with God. And that really gives us a key to how God intended for us to function, never apart from Him, ever. And we have divorced it. And in my mind, I had, like, when, before I really read this closely, I had in my mind that God said, like, in a big, loud, James Earl Jones voice, um, Adam, you shall name the animals now. Go do it. See me when you're done. You know, and that's the way I pictured it happening. But that's not what the scripture said. Mm -hmm. Instead, God was bringing them, and he was naming them, was and there was a union and communion between them. Right from the beginning. It wasn't distanced. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note here is that God had a purpose for this naming job. And it wasn't to get the animals named. That's what was stated to Adam. But his deeper purpose was, it's not good for man to be alone. Mm -hmm. And so his goal was to cause an awakening in Adam of a need. And he could have gone out and said, hey, Adam, by the way, you got a problem? You don't have a wife. Dang. I'm going to fix that for you. Don't worry. I got it covered. Cool. I'll just sit back so, and bump on. But he, he didn't do that. <laughs> And said in his infinite wisdom, because I believe God is really interested in our growth. He really wants us to mature. And for that process, I think he values that process way more than we do. We value end goal. Like that's the way our world runs, right? But God values process. So he doesn't go up and say, Adam, you got a problem. I'm going to fix it. Be, you're going to be okay. Just go to sleep for a little while. And when you wake up, it'll all be good. He doesn't say that. He, he says, We've, I, it's not good for him to be alone. And then he, they start doing this naming thing. And then he puts him to sleep at the right time. He makes an uh, Eve out of his body, solves the problem for him, brings Eve along. And we know, based off of Adam's response, that he understood he had a problem. This was not like a shocker to him. Because his response is, on the next page, this one at last. That's a really important two phrase, two word phrase there. At last. That means he had seen everything else that was going on and now he went, at last. There's yeah. someone who matches me. Yeah. This one is like me. At last. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now that tells us some interesting things about Adam. He knows that his form and function was different than all the other creatures. He, did, he was not confused. He did not think he was part monkey or something. He knew what he was, and he was not what he was seeing. And he was waiting for the one that would complete him. He must have recognized male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female. Real, female. real quick, in the Hebrew, that word at last, I was looking at King James... It's uh, H6471. It's the word pa'am. And that word literally means this time. Uh, in the sense of striking an anvil 
Ta'am, this time. And to, it, so it's at last, this time, translated any other way. It's this occurrence, this pointing to specifically this. Right. So, and yeah. And he brings. Yeah, Shazam. Yeah. Woohoo! Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is he recognized. So there was a distinction in the text and pointing to that. In addition, God was acting in exactly the same way he had been acting. Remember, he had been forming animals, bringing them to Adam, and Adam was naming them. And so this was the process. So now he goes to sleep for a while, wakes up, and God brings him another animal, if you will. That's what he was expecting. But he looks at it and goes, this isn't an animal. This is of me. So there's, there is a recognition there that this is different than everything else that has come in. And so God was teaching him something about himself. He needed someone else to fulfill the mission. He also taught him about authority. This woman is of me. And so he names her, which implies an authority. Every single time in the Hebrew text that someone names someone else or a name is given, it establishes authority. You cannot name unless if you have authority. It's a big deal when Jesus says that he's going to give you a new name in Revelation because he's taking ownership over you and, and, and putting his name on you is a big deal. That is like a, a huge monumental deal. Um, so Adam named his wife woman because she was taken from man. And then you get this little summary statement in the text that says, this is why a man shall leave his father and mother and bonds to or cleaves to or clings to his wife and they become one flesh. So that's the summary learning statement. And this is the way God teaches, by the way. He, you walk through the physical, and then he gives you the summary. Um, this is the way we were to learn wisdom. This, is, this was it. It's in our work. That's why work isn't bad. Work is very, very good. It was created by God to be enjoyed, to learn things about him and about ourselves. And in a perfect world, there was no pain or toil with it. Sin screwed that up for us. But it was still the way and the method that we learn about him. And so when you get into things like uh, circumstances, <laughs> fun, <laughs> diaper, <laughs> missing the body that it goes with. <laughs> Um, so I want to know, did Adam crack up when God brought him to the I mean, was that a terrible moment? So, I don't know. Probably. I crack up when I see a lot of the animals God created. He gives a sense of humor. Um, that's, that's probably it, other than... Um, Oh, the other thing I think that's really important is both man and his wife were naked yet felt no shame. This, this idea of nakedness is also just prevalent throughout the scriptures. I think immediately of Hebrews where he talks about the sword of the spirit or the sword of, which is the word of God is a two-edged sword and it divides out the soul from the spirit. It's going to be a very important concept actually because one of the things that happened in the fall is that our soul and spirit got sort of twisted up. And it became hard to understand and discern what really was in the inner parts of man. We lost connection mm -hmm. with what was inside. And we have a hard time processing it. And it's because the, the, the fall twisted that all up. What we think, we don't think the thoughts of God any longer. We don't feel rightly about things any longer. Our will is bent towards the things of earth instead of the things that are of our Heavenly Father. And so we're constantly fighting against this downward dragging pool. Mm. And that's why we're told we have to renew our mind. That's why we're told that um, we need the Word of God to, to do surgery on us, to cut us, to discern where we are still thinking like this earthly world of fallen system and not like God's system of grace and love and peace. So, um, anyway, I don't want to really get into the next thing, but there was no pain in being exposed prior to the fall. There wasn't any shame. There was no sin to be ashamed about. 
So, you know, our nakedness before God was the way that we started. And even babies, I mean, they come out not clothed. They come out naked. And I think it's, I think it's a picture. And, and no parent goes, oh, you ugly thing. Why don't you have clothes on? Do you cover it up? You know? They, you don't do that. You're like, oh, they're sweet. You know, when you love them and God loves us in our vulnerability. And we're safe in that vulnerability. And that's what he wanted with us. You know, he was such, he was such a loving guy to have formed us. And then to breathe, the first thing he does with mankind, you realize that the first thing he does with mankind is breathe his own breath into you? He gave his very self into you? That's the very first action he does. And then after he does that, he goes, it's very good. That's what he thinks about you. He's, he's not down there, you know, up there trying to figure out every little area you missed up and trying to beat you up for it. Mm. He created you and mm. put himself into you. And that ever-giving nature is what continues on every day of your life as he's constantly saying, come home, come home, come home. I just want to be with you. I created you for me. I created to be in communion with me. I wanted you with me. I wanted to teach you. I didn't want you taught by this world system. I wanted to teach you. I wanted to teach you the good that I had for you and to enjoy me and to be like me. Praise the Lord that he provided a way of redemption. Let's get back to you. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word and for your good intention towards us. That you created us to know you and that you even wanted to know us. You didn't create us like the animals, which certainly glorify your name. But you created us so that we could have a relationship that's dynamic with you. Lord, I just pray that you would give everybody here a, a greater heart, a expanded desire in our will to reach out to you and know you more. And that you would fill us with your spirit. Show us where we have things that are keeping us from you, that might be hindering us from seeing you for who you truly are. Lord, I just pray that you would uh, continue to do the work necessary to soften our hearts. Lord, it said in Jeremiah 31, 31, that you would give us a heart of flesh, a heart of flesh instead of stone one that is able to receive your word and respond to it, that would be softened. Lord, I just pray that we would receive, we would be receptive to all that you would give us. And Lord, I pray that you would grant us a spirit of repentance. We sin in many ways every day. As we walk away from we don't even know it. We're so deceived by our own heart desires. And Lord, I just pray that we would be humble before you because we know that you will not despise a humble and a contrite heart mm. but a proud heart you turn away from lord let us not be proud or maybe be humble before you mm. lord i pray that as we as we humble ourselves and we ask you we confess our sins we return away from them towards you, that you would open your arms to us and we would experience your love. I know that you love us, Lord. Make it so that we can understand it, we can feel it, correct our wrong thinking about you. Lord, I pray mm. healing over everybody present right now. Yes. We all have baggage. We all have areas where we've, we've struggled, where we have been rejected, where we've um, had pain from either people or ourselves that we've done to ourselves, Lord, and I just pray that you're, you would begin that healing process in us and, and keep going until we are wholly yours. Lord, we long for you, we desire you, and I just pray that as we move into worship of you, that you would flood our souls with your joy and that peace would reign in our hearts. And Lord, that we would become the lights that this world desperately needs because of your Son shining through us. In your name we ask it, Lord Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen. This uh, concludes the first part. I think this sounds like it's going to be three parts, ironically. <laughs>
uh, <laughs> just just based on the subject matter, the content. Uh, I'll send this out to you, email, just if you guys want it. Uh, this um, free reproduction. This is not. Um, we didn't. This, <laughs> this is glorious. This is the gospel. So. Um, this concludes the tape.